so grateful for the opportunity to introduce today's convocation speaker, Dr. Jorge Castaneda. Dr. Castaneda served as foreign prime minister of Mexico from 2000 to 2003. He is a renowned public intellectual, social scientist, and prolific writer. With expertise in Mexican and Latin American politics, comparative politics, and U.S.-Mexican and U.S.-Latin American relations, he has been a professor at a number of colleges and universities, including the University of California, Berkeley, Princeton University, New York University, the University of Cambridge, and the National Autonomous University of Mexico. A regular commentator for CNN and an occasional writer of guest essays at the New York Times, Dr. Castaneda is also the author of more than 20 books, including his most recent, America Through Foreign Eyes. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Castaneda to Carleton College. Thank you very much. I appreciate the introduction. It's an honor to be here with you today. I've been looking forward to this talk for some time. It took us a while Al, to get it all set up, but we finally did, and I'm glad we did. I was told I was going to be coming here in the spring. Um, I guess that depends on your definition of spring. <laughs> But it is an honor to be here, and it's, uh, it's a wonderful opportunity for me to try and share some thoughts with you on uh, where Latin America stands today in general, and also in relation to the United States. Um, always parting from the premise that we always feel in Latin America that we are not paid sufficient attention to by the United States. And then when the United States does pay attention, we say, actually, it was better off, we were doing better when the United States did not pay attention. And we go on and on with this more or less endlessly, uh, and we haven't reached any real conclusion as to what's best, uh, being paid attention to or just sort of uh, have, be the object of <clears throat> benign neglect, as they used to say. Uh, this is a propitious opportunity to talk about these issues and write about them because some of you may know, and uh, now a little more, uh, barely a month from now in Los Angeles, at the beginning of June, uh, President Biden will be hosting the triannual, sometimes every four years, uh, Summit of the Americas. And it will be held for the first time in the United States since 1994, when the first one was held in Miami, uh, hosted by Pres then President Clinton. Um, this is a strange, uh, meeting because it doesn't have any formal structure to it. It doesn't have any sort of official stature. It's sort of linked to the OAS, the Organization of American States. But what's important about it this time, of course, is one, it's being hosted by President Biden in the United States. And so it is especially important for him and for the administration to put forward an agenda issues that they want to, to discuss with their Latin American colleagues, presidents, heads of state, um, and hopefully some of these issues actually will be discussed. It's a two and a half day meeting. I attended one of those in, um, in, <clears throat> in Canada in 2001, I think, early 2001 in Quebec City. And uh, they can actually be very useful, although sometimes they're awkward because you have leaders who are sitting in the same room at the same table who don't necessarily like each other a whole lot. Um, th on this occasion, apparently, they're solving that question by just not inviting the guys they don't like. Um, uh, the president of Cuba, I understand it, is not invited. The president of Nicaragua isn't invited. And the... Uh, um, de facto president of Venezuela is not invited. I'm not terribly upset that they're not invited, quite frankly. I think it's not a bad thing that they won't be there, but 
you can argue that back and forth. Um, the president of El Salvador apparently will be invited. I'm not sure I understand exactly why, but so there will be a little room for awkwardness. Anyway, all of this to say that um, <clears throat> we're at a moment where these issues may be important, if only for because of the summit of the Americas. Uh, Latin America is a little bit, as you know, sort of the world's middle class. Um, we're not, um, re obviously we're not rich, uh, we're not the, the one percenters, uh, but we're not that poor anymore either. Uh, we're sort of this lower middle class. Um, by GDP, by the extension and the depth of poverty, uh, by the degree of inequality, by levels of education, health, housing, etc. We're sort of in between. Uh, obviously, there are far poorer countries in Africa and Asia, and there are far wealthier countries in Western Europe, the United States, Canada, Japan, South Korea, etc. And so we're stuck in this in-between place, this sort of limbo, which um, makes it difficult for the region to really have much of a say in the world. We would like to have more of a say by the size of our population, by our creative talent, by the size of our economies, particularly economies such as Mexico's and Brazil's. But you know, this middle class status is kind of complicated. The economists have even invented a term for this, the middle class trap. Where, uh, or middle income trap, but it could be called the middle class of the world trap, where countries like those of Latin America, which grew a lot up until a certain point, got stuck and didn't grow anymore. They call that the middle income trap, but it reflects this notion of being somewhere in the middle. And this makes us on occasion less interesting, perhaps, to the world, to academia, to diplomats, to uh, banks, investors, etc., than we would like. Um, for a long time in the 60s and 70s, uh, we had this extraordinary generation of writers that uh, made us attractive, interesting, seductive, regardless of our economic or social political performance. Uh, most of them, practically all of them, the exception of Mario Vargas Llosa, have passed on, and we haven't come up with a new crop and that also has made life sort of complicated uh, for us. And we're going through a difficult moment today in Latin America. It's not that there have been great moments in the past, but this has been a particularly difficult one. In spite of the enormous gains that were made, let's say, over the last 30 years, and I'm using 30 just as a ballpark figure, could be a little more, a little less, over these 30 years, Several things have happened which have been very uh, positive, have been very uh, noteworthy. First of all, for, with the exceptions I mentioned regarding the summit of the Americas, uh, practically every country in Latin America is today a representative democracy. If only because the way you get to power is by getting votes. And the way they get to throw you out of power is by not getting votes. Um, this is not the way it used to be. If you look over the last 200 years of Latin American history, in fact, the number of years and the number of countries where that has been the case is rather small. The last 30 years, with the exceptions we're all familiar with and with the imperfections that uh, are obviously there, basically now you want to be president of a country in Latin America, you got to go out and get elected. And you want to get rid of a guy, a woman, uh, who's president, you have to go out and get the votes to throw them out. And this is a big deal. It sounds kind of obvious to many Americans, uh, but it's not, and it's never been obvious to us. And this is a huge achievement, which I certainly don't think anyone should underestimate. It's also true that for a series of reasons, um, a lot of progress has been made in Latin America the last 30 years in reducing poverty and inequality much less than what should have been done, given the fact that we had high commodity uh, prices, that the world economy has grown enormously these last 30 years, uh, given also that an a lot of 
uh, important economic reforms took place in Latin America starting in the late 1980s, early 1990s, but nonetheless, <clears throat> Less was, we, we did not achieve what we should have, but we achieved a lot. Countries like Chile, for example, are almost now eh, poor, rich countries, which you will say, you know, it's not a great goal in life. Uh, what would you like to be when you graduate from Carleton? You'd like to be a poor, rich doctor. Maybe that's not really what your professors are all trying to uh, get you to achieve, but for Latin American countries, this would be a big deal. It was sort of place Chile, level of Greece, Portugal. Uh, actually, it's not bad at all. Um, there's a couple of other countries in that area, Uruguay, regions of Mexico and Brazil, the Argentines when they don't mess things up, which is... Um, not often, <laughs> they're very good at that. Um, <clears throat> but despite these achievements over 30 years, these have been very difficult times the last couple of years. Uh, practically every country, with the possible exception of Uruguay and in a second stage, Chile, messed up the COVID uh, situation. Uh, it's not that a whole lot of countries got it right, um, there are a few who did very well from the very beginning, and there are a bunch who went up and down over the two-year period. No country really can be terribly proud of how well they did over the entire period. But in Latin America, most countries got it wrong. Got it wrong either because of ridiculous statements, which may sound familiar to some of you, um, by the presidents of Mexico and Brazil, that this was just a cold, a common cold, that this was no big deal. Uh, that it really didn't matter too much and that nothing should be done about it. Uh, that made those, both countries, with a lot of people, we're talking about 400 million people between the two of them, um, wasting a lot of time before actually starting to uh, lock down, wear face masks, isolate, etc. cetera. Um, it was not a good time. Some countries have the highest levels of excess deaths per capita in the world. Peru, Mexico are in the top three or four in the most recent study carried out by the World Health Organization, which has been leaked but not made public because the Indians don't want to make it public yet. And they have a lot of clout in WHO. The ensuing economic contraction in Latin America also was not well handled with some exceptions and was very severe. 2020, uh, <clears throat> the economic contraction was on an average of 7%, about twice the United States contraction. And without the social safety net that the United States, tattered social safety net, but better than none, or the Europeans have. No unemployment insurance, not all countries poured money into the economy either because they didn't have it or didn't want to do it. Um, <clears throat> very uh, mediocre health, uh, social security or health care uh, for people out of work. It was a, a rough time, economically uh, speaking. And <clears throat> in addition, you know, we've had problems that have come to compound this. Um, the war in Ukraine has had a very paradoxical effect in Latin America. You will say, well, it's certainly not our fault. And, uh, you know, it would be worse if instead of it being a war, an invasion of Ukraine, there was a war in Bolivia. Um, it's far away, so I guess that's better for us in one sense. But it has had a huge impact in Latin America, partly because it uh, has centered attention. And as it is, we don't receive a lot of attention. So. Receiving even less is not great. Um, there have been real issues with some supply chains for Latin America. Brazil is now the third or fourth largest food exporter in the world. And 75% of the fertilizer it uses was produced in Ukraine. And obviously it's not being produced anymore uh, or not being delivered. 
for all sorts of reasons. And so they have their own economic com complications because of a war that is 10,000 miles away. Um, and it's also been complicated for Latin American countries because uh, the United States and the Biden administration have quite understandably, and I think correctly, taken the issue to the United Nations, to the Organization of American States, to a bunch of international uh, age, en entities, and forced countries or obliged countries to take a stand. And I think that's been just fine, except a lot of Latin American countries have diff taken different stances on it, and some have preferred not to be as explicit in condemning the invasion as others have been, and there will be a price to pay for that. And then we continue to be plagued, as always, <laughs> by issues such as corruption and violence, which continue to be a very serious Latin American uh, diseases, if you want to call them so. It's not that we're the only corrupt uh, <clears throat> places in the world. There's a bunch of other ones. Uh, and it's not that we're the only, the most, the only violent region in the world. There are a lot of others. But we do pretty well on both counts. And this is something that is very difficult to manage because nobody really knows how to eliminate it. There are three or four countries in Latin America that are not especially plagued by corruption. Chile, Uruguay, Costa Rica. Probably about it. Um, and so you could say, well, if these guys can, then why can't everybody else? Well, these, why, these guys always could. They never were really very corrupt. Some people say, and there's a logic to it, Chile is a country where corruption was never widespread, never significant, because it was a poor colony. When they were a colony of Spain's, there was nothing there. There was no silver, there was no gold, there was no nothing. So people didn't learn how to steal because there was nothing to steal. And that's a pretty good reason, actually. It's a good explanation. I'm not sure it's entirely accurate, but it sounds, it makes sense. Of course, a place like Peru or Bolivia or Mexico, you had these astounding riches, wealth, that it was very easy to rip off the crown uh, of Spain, uh, you know, thousands of miles away, no communication, with very uh, <clears throat> low levels of uh, fiscalization and of actually uh, paying attention to what was going on in the New World, as they called it. Uh, so you could do pretty much what you wanted. And they did. Uh, so, you know, all of these things are still there with us, and we're, we're trying to manage them. We would like, of course, to have a great deal more of support from the United States in managing them. Not just money, though money counts, but all sorts of things. Um, particularly because, despite the fact that most of the time the United States, as I said, does not pay a lot of attention to the region, and we could argue for a long time of whether that's a good thing or a bad thing. Um, the fact is, we still um, matter a great deal to the United States, and that's an issue that Americans have certain difficulty in coming to grips with. I'll just go through some of the issues that we've, have been in the headlines the last few years, which are pretty much the ones that have been in the headlines for a long time. Uh, but you can see how close they are to your everyday lives and to the everyday lives of uh, tens of millions of Americans, if not to all Americans. Obviously, the most important factor is immigration. It's a big deal. A big deal politically in the United States, a big deal socially and culturally in the United States, and a big deal economically in the sending countries. In Mexico, just to give you an example, we received upwards of $50 billion last year in remittances from our countrymen in the United States. That's about <clears throat> three or three odd times um, um, oil exports for Mexico. Uh, it's almost twice what we get from tourism. Um, it's um, twice the total amount of foreign investment in Mexico in a year. Fifty billion dollars is a lot of money. It's about four points of GDP. Of course, if you go to El Salvador, which is a tiny little place of five, six million people, 
um, they receive something like 20% of GDP in remittances. Not as much as we do because they're smaller, but a higher percentage of their economy. And as you know, in the United States, immigration is not only a touchy issue, it's one that Americans face in one way or another every day. Um, I obviously think for better, I think the United States is the fascinating, um, attractive, extraordinary country it, it is, partly in th thanks to immigration. Immigration dating back to the middle of the 19th century and until last week, um, when something like a thousand Mexicans per day arrived without papers at the border. <laughs> That's about, sometimes it's more, but it's around that. Uh, but a, a lot of Americans don't agree with that kind of statement, and politically this has become an extraordinarily touchy issue. We're chatting with some students, a young, young man who's a dreamer, uh, had a chance to chat with him at breakfast, um, uh, and we were just recalling how many attempts there have been at um, comprehensive immigration reform or immigration agreements with other countries um, since 9-11, uh, uh, when we almost had a deal, we Mexicans almost had a deal with the Bush administration. Um, and it's been 20 years and several attempts by people who are not, you know, just anybody. Bush tried to do it, Senators McCain and Kennedy tried to do it, President Obama tried to do it, President Biden, along with Senator Menendez, tried to do it just last year, and none of them have gotten anywhere. It gives you a sense of how complicated the issue is politically and legally in Washington, and how complicated it is for Americans. And, you know, some of us, I mean, I think all of us understand it in, from abroad. We're not, you know, in, uh, insensitive to the concerns Americans have on the issue. I went, I remember a long time ago now, it must have been 10, 15 years ago, to um, <clears throat> Butler County in Ohio. I don't know if any of you have heard of Butler County in Ohio. Well, if you haven't, you haven't missed a whole lot, but don't, don't worry about it. You don't have to go there. But anyway, so I went there to a very good school there, and I gave a talk, and they told me about some crazy mayor they had there. Uh, I don't remember the name of the town, but the county is Butler County. And they were terribly upset because there was a new community of Mexicans there. New meaning, you know, four or five years old. And, you know, all sorts of th things were wrong with the Mexicans according to the uh, natives of Butler County. The first thing that they didn't like at all, and they were very upset about, is that, you know, Ohio is football country, right? That, that's what they do in Ohio. They play football, they talk about football, watch football, that, that's it. Okay. So, all of a sudden they were seeing all these crazy Mexicans playing with a round ball, not oblong ball. And they thought this was terrible. They also went to different churches, spoke a different language, ate this crazy spicy food that obviously no normal person can eat, listened to crazy music all night long, watched these ridiculous programs on television, the telenovelas, um, and they were incredibly upset about all of a sudden having this very exotic but also alien community in their midst. And they got scared, understandably scared, understandably upset. Obviously, this is not the case in California. It's not the case in Texas. It's not a, the case here in Chicago. Uh, the first Mexicans arrived in Chicago turn of the century, of last century. Um, you know, La Villita's been around for well over a century now. So it's no big deal. But in Butler County and a bunch of other places all over the United States, it is because Mexicans and Central Americans have begun to, began to spread out in the United States um, for reasons that were typically serendipitous, or if you like, anti-serendipitous, because it was not for a, a fortunate outcome, 
when the Clinton administration starts building the wall in 1993-94, because that's where the wall began. It's not Trump's wall. It was Bill Clinton's wall to begin with. And when they started cracking down on a series of forms of immigration and increasing the number of Border Patrol people and money, Mexicans who used to come and go every year had to stay because it was, became increasingly difficult and expensive and dangerous to cross again. So Mexicans who had a very good arrangement, not unlike mine, I teach four months a year at NYU, and the rest of the time I'm in Mexico basically hanging out. Um, obviously that's not the case of all of my compatriots, but with what a lot of them used to make four or five months here, they could have a very nice other six months of the year in Mexico. The minute they started, stopped being able to come and go, they had to stay here. Had to stay here, they had to find work all year long, not just the harvests or not just the um, <clears throat> summer season, the tourist season, etc. And so they began to spread out and stop coming and going. And so that led to the presence of Mexicans all over the place, even in places like the Twin Cities and parts of Minnesota. We opened our consulate here in uh, 2005, if I'm not mistaken. Uh, we, did, we never had had one. And the best sign that there's a bunch of Mexicans somewhere around is when the Mexican government opens our consulates there because we know where there are Mexicans and that's where we open a consulate. We shut some down because there aren't any Mexicans left there for some reason. We did that at one point with New Orleans. We opened one in Anchorage and then we closed it because for a while there were Mexicans there in the fishing industry and then it got too cold or something um, and they decided to leave so we shut it down. So immigration is an issue that is there for the United States every day, and it's increasingly important for a number of Latin American countries. Now, there, used, there was a time when Mexicans were, we were 50, 60 percent of people coming to the United States. Now, there are Hondurans, Salvadorians, Guatemalans, increasingly Nicaraguans, Venezuelans, Ecuadorians, of course, Haitians, as you all saw on television, and increasingly, and this is an issue we were talking about yesterday, Cubans. Cubans, you know, are they political? Are they economic? Are they both? Probably both. Uh, you treat them like refugees. You treat them like migrants. Can't send them back. Very difficult to send them back. Can't keep them in Mexico that easily. There's a lot of people if you start adding up from all of these countries. There was a time, as I said, it was essentially Mexico. Now it's all told about 10 countries from Latin America, without even mentioning Afghanistan, Syria, now Ukraine. Drugs. I don't like to put immigration and drugs together as, uh, and sort of play to the right-wing uh, choir uh, chorus to the effect that uh, the immigrants bring drugs in with them. But these are two of the ways that Latin America does have this impact on the United States. And it does. Uh, and this has been the case since the 1960s. It's not new. And it will continue. Why? Well, for the reasons we all know, the American market, the American consumer of drugs, and the suppliers that are Latin Americans. Latin Americans for all sorts of strange reasons, some quite honestly unfathomable. Why does coca leaf only grow in <clears throat> three countries in the world, Colombia, Peru, and Bolivia? No one has a good answer. There's nothing that special about these three places. For some reason, you won't find coca leaf practically anywhere else. Well, that's a fact, and obviously it's not worth growing coca leaf if you're not going to turn it into cocaine and send it to the United States. But if it's not cocaine, then it becomes heroin. If it's not heroin, it's fentanyl. As you know, and I don't know if Minnesota is a state that's been particularly affected, but many other states have, uh, there were over 100,000 opioid-related uh, overdose deaths 
last year in the United States. And 60, 70% of those were from fentanyl. And most of the fentanyl comes through Mexico. The Chinese send it to Mexico, or they send the chemicals, the ingredients to Mexico. Or they put them together in the labs. Stuff is so powerful, you can send it through FedEx to the United States or you can put it in a car, in a suitcase. You don't need these big bulky trailers to bring it in like Mexican it used to be the case back in the 1970s. Some of you may remember uh, with Mexican marijuana, so-called Acapulco gold, uh, that you just need a tiny amount and make a lot of money on it. And this is, I wouldn't say an insatiable market, but it's a big market. The United States is a big market for anything so it's a big market for drugs too. It's not especially a big market for drugs. It's as much of a big market for drugs as it is for anything else. And that means that this is what a lot of Latin American countries do. They export whatever can be exported to the United States. If it's legal or illegal, is kind of irrelevant and you will have Mexicans, for example, like my cur current government, and we all did this at some point with more or less emphasis, will argue when the Americans start giving us grief about why don't you stop all these illegal exports to the United States, we say, why don't you stop your illegal exports, for example, of arms to Mexico? You, you want to get into that argument about illegal exports? What about yours? Well, we have the Second Amendment. Well, that's great. So what? <laughs> Last I heard, the Second Amendment of the Constitution is part of the United States Constitution. That's not part of the Mexican Constitution or the Guatemalan Constitution or anybody else's Constitution. So why don't you stop illegal arms exports to Mexico? Well, because you don't want to put up the money to do it, just the way we don't want to put up, not just the money, the money, the people, the blood, everything else. The United States could conceivably... Uh, deploy hundreds of thousands of troops along the Mexican border to stop people and drugs from coming in and stop guns from going out. American society is not willing to pay for that, and rightly so. I'm glad it isn't wi willing to pay for that. But that same argument cuts both ways. And finally, the United States, or Latin America, is becoming increasingly important for the United States, because of a single word which is getting more and more complicated, and that word is China. Um, we are moving towards something like, and you can choose the word you like best, a new Cold War, confrontation, Thucydides trap, uh, rivalry. It, it doesn't make a whole lot of difference. What we know is that the United States and China are on some sort of collision course economically, militarily, politically, ge geopolitically, even culturally. <clears throat> uh, the Chinese are opening more and more Confucius institutes all over the world. Obviously, they have no uh, way of rivaling, of competing with the American cultural presence all over the world, with what I try to call, along with many others in this book that I just published, uh, American Civilization. The Chinese can't compete with that abroad because of the language, because of the period of time, because of the uh, <clears throat> multifacetic aspects of American civilization. That's why it's a civilization. But they're trying. And in this rivalry or confrontation, or whatever you prefer to call it, Latin America is once again, like with the Soviet Union, a battleground. It was so much of a battleground with, in the Cold War with the Soviet Union that the place where and when that confrontation almost became violent directly was Cuba in 1962. Nothing like that is probably going to happen with China, but what is true is that China is one, uh, Latin America is one of the battlegrounds where this is playing out. Economically, the Chinese are buying enormous amounts of land to produce soybeans, mines for copper and iron and coal, oil fields for oil. 
then the infrastructure that goes together with this, bridges, highways, ports, railroads, then <clears throat> the political accompaniment that goes with all these investments, and then the beginning of some military involvement, very few countries, only Argentina a little bit, little bit in Venezuela, but not really. But it will come. A lot of people in Latin America say, we don't want to get involved in this new Cold War. It's not our problem. But at the same time, it doesn't only depend on us. It depends on the Americans and on the Chinese. If the Americans want to make a big fuss over the Chinese presence in Latin America, they will have certain valid reasons for doing so. If uh, the Chinese want to become more aggressive, more ideological, more military, more political, uh, they will do so and the Americans will respond in the same way that the Americans responded with the Soviets now half a century ago or more. So in conclusion, yes, Latin America matters a whole bunch to the United States. I could go on with many other um, forms of interdependence and integration, especially, of course, with Mexico, Central America, and the Caribbean, much less so with countries like Brazil, like Argentina, even Colombia. But the examples I gave, I think, are sufficient to give you a sense of how this does count. And so, a little bit what I'd like to, to leave a message to Americans about is uh, that, you know, Washington and the United States, but it's a Washington issue more than a United States issue, uh, should mind its store. Uh, in, in, in Mexico, we have it in Spanish, I think, but in Mexico, we certainly have an expression, quien tenga tienda que la tienda. Is that, does that work in Cuban also? Okay. <laughs> the Cuban's a strange kind of Spanish. I mean, it's, 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 you, know, it's you don't want to take it too literally. Um, it, you have a store, mind it. Uh, and the United States should mind the Latin American store. Obviously not the backyard. No one likes the expression backyard, and I intentionally don't use it. But the store is a good word. It has to mind the store. And um, <clears throat> it doesn't cost a whole lot, and the payoff is enormous. So I hope that the Biden administration at this upcoming summit will do some of that, and I also hope that I've been able to convince some of you of how important this all is. Thank you very, very much. Thank you. Thank you very much. To Thank you very much, Dr. Castaneda. And uh, we do have time. We have plenty of time for Q&A, which I've been informed is Dr. Castaneda's very favorite part. So hopefully you have lots of questions. Before we get to it, just to mention super quick, like there's only two more convocations left in the, in the convocation series for this term, for this academic year. Uh, also, that there is a, another space or two left at the table for luncheon. So if you're interested in the luncheon, please see me after the convocation. And now, Questions and answers. Thank you so much for coming. Um, uh, that was uh, incredibly interesting. As kind of one of the major economic powers in Latin America, I was wondering what responsibility you think Mexico has to work to organize Latin American countries and construct like internal solutions within Latin America? And do you think it's exercising that responsibility well in what it's doing? Uh, and in what ways do you think you know, new initiatives need to be shaped? Well, I guess in a nutshell, the answer is no. <laughs> uh, but I'll try and give some detail on it. By the way, uh, I, I asked to be able to mingle with you during the Q&A period, but I was told that because this is being taped, can't do that, but otherwise I would prefer that. But anyway, um, you know, it, it, Mexico, be, not only because of the size of its economy and its population, but also because of the impact and the sort of 
weight it carries, at least in Central America, the Caribbean, and maybe a few of the South American countries, not with the Brazilians, they don't like us. We like them, but what we like basically is how they play soccer, that's about it. Uh, and they don't like us at all except, not even, they don't even like the mariachis, the rest of the Latin Americans do, but the Brazilians don't. But with that exception, yes, we do carry a lot of weight and we could uh, be much more forceful in pushing fundamental regional and international issues like the fight against climate change, against corruption, um, <clears throat> for democracy, against human rights violations. Mexico could be a much more important spokes country for these causes and many others. Um, immigration reform, not discouraging and not deterring immigration, which is basically what we're doing, doing, doing the United States dirty work for it, uh, which I, I fail to see why we should be doing, but we do, um, or even on drugs. But we have had now for some time, and it's a Mexican tradition a little bit, goes back to 50, 60 years, that we like to sort of mind our own business. We don't like to get in too involved in international affairs. Every now and then we will, the Central America in the 1980s, the beginning of this century on human rights, etc., cetera, uh, around 2010 and climate change, but most of the time we don't like to get involved in these matters. And so we have very little leverage with the Central Americans, with the Caribbean countries, with a few others. Um, when we ask them, you know, don't you think we should stand up for this or that here or there? Uh, they look at us and they say, where were you when whatever happened? And you know, we, are, we punch way below our weight in international affairs, given our tradition, given our size, given, I don't, wouldn't say prestige, but there is a little bit of that. Mexico is a well-known country. We travel all over the world and you know, people know us. They don't necessarily know us for the best of reasons. The most well-known Mexican in the world by far is Chapo Guzman, of course. Uh, well, you know, you get what you get. That's, uh, that's who we have. Uh, but I think I would agree with you, we could do much more. Thank you for a great talk. The competition with the Soviet Union, the United States competition with the Soviet Union in Latin America, led to the Alliance for Progress, the creation of the Inter-American Development Bank, a number of inter-American institutions. If, if Joe Biden were to pick up the phone and, and say to you, well, what should we do now akin, if we want to compete intelligently with, with the Chinese, what would it be? Would it be recapitalizing the development banks? Would it be creating new institutions? What would a healthy competition look like? Well, it would be a very long phone call uh, because I would have a lot of things uh, to say to him, uh, but I'd start with two. One very focal one for the United States, which is pouring as much money as possible into the Northern Triangle for the purposes of discouraging immigration. And Biden has said this, and Vice President Harris has said this at countless times, but they don't put the money, they don't put the money where their talk is, or where their mouth is. Uh, there's no money. And so just saying that they want to attack the root causes of irregular immigration from Central America, and then not putting up the money makes no sense. And at the end of the day, it has to be public money, like the Alliance for Progress was. You know, uh, American companies weren't going to invest in Colombia in uh, the early 1960s uh, because President Kennedy asked them to. Uh, it, either President Kennedy put up the money or nobody was gonna do it. He did for three years and then President Johnson forgot the whole thing, that was the end of that. The second thing I would do is education. Uh, <clears throat> Speaking of the devil, um, China has somewhere like 250,000 college students in the United States. Mexico has about 13,000. There are 10 times more uh, Chinese and Mexicans, but there's 20 times more students where we're kind of closer to the United States 
uh, than the Chinese. We've got a, a river. Most of the time it's dry anyway. Between us and the United States, uh, the Chinese have the Pacific Ocean. Uh, the Biden administration and the United States could do much more. Again, it costs money. Putting real money into bringing Mexican, Central American, South American students, college, graduate, to the United States. There are all sorts of complications. Granted, language is one of them. Ac academic qualifications is, is an issue. Yes, that's also true. But there, I can't understand why the Chinese find this so much easier to do than we do, or that the Americans could do with us. That would be probably the most productive investment for the United States over time in the context of a new confrontation or rivalry, not unlike the Cold War with the Soviet Union. Hello? There you go. Thank you so much for coming. Uh, I had a question about democratic backsliding. So obviously there's been a wave of democratic backsliding globally, and North and South America, definitely both participants in that to uh, varying degrees. Uh, is the solution to democratic backsliding is it something that's regional? Is it national? Does it have to come from like the NATOs of the world, the OASs of the world, or is it something that countries have to figure out on their own within their own institutions and governments? Well, you know, it's 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 difficult to say because for many years the Europeans thought that the best um, obstacle to democratic backsliding in the European Union, with places like Spain, like Portugal, like Greece plus the new ex-socialist countries, was the European Union itself, was the European anchor, that all of these places would be anchored, anchor their democratic institutions, root them in treaties, courts, etc. And now you have Orban and you have the Poles. And it turns out that the European Union and Brussels and Luxembourg are much less effective at doing a whole lot about Hungary and Poland than one would have expected. So when you look at Latin America, the first thing that I had that came to my mind when I had something I could do about it was to try and lock Mexico and other places into a democratic framework so that there would be no backsliding, whether these be treaties, participation in conferences, organizations, etc. Uh, we. Uh, wrote and got people to sign the Inter-American Democratic Charter, which was actually signed on September 11th, 2001 in Lima, uh, along with Colin Powell and many others. I was one of the signatories. We were there together that morning. Um, you know, I thought that this was the sort of thing that would be most helpful. I must confess I have my doubts looking at the European record on this matter, but I still think that most of our countries left to ourselves have a great deal of difficulty in confronting our demons from the past. Like the Spanish, more the Spanish than Portuguese and the Greeks, the Spanish are spooky. And that's why Felipe Gonzalez, their fellow who was their prime minister for 15 years, wanted to root Spanish democracy as much as possible into European institutions and NATO. It's not a very satisfactory answer, I'm sorry, but that's, uh, <laughs> that's what I have at this particular stage in my thinking on the matter. Hi, Dr. Castaneda, thank you for coming, by the way. Um, I just wanted to ask, I think you've kind of characterized really broadly two different approaches to the future of Latin America, one in which you have an authoritarian presence like China dictating policy, dictating the, the larger imperialist economic presence in the region, and one in which the United States is, is the um, primary power influencing policy. But I was curious to what role you saw um, Latin America pursuing any sort of um, more autonomous approaches to development or autonomous approaches to um, structuring policy that might not necessarily involve um, one of the new great powers. To what extent can Latin America push forward for reforms and new projects where they're not necessarily dependent on the ideologies or the investments of external factors? 
Well, uh, I think it's, it's two different uh, things. The, the policies can be concocted, can be designed anywhere, and we have uh, more than sufficient competent economists, uh, political scientists, uh, public administrators in the region to be able to develop policies that are different perhaps from what the Americans and or the Chinese uh, try to convince us of, or the Europeans for that matter, who rarely actually push their stuff. They should, but they don't. Um, the investment and the trade is a different story. Um, you know, Latin America is a region that requires capital from abroad because of its levels of development. It cannot grow without a significant amount of foreign investment. Now, you can have endless discussions about whether that foreign investment should be directed at industry or at services or at extractive activities or tourism, etc. We can go on and on with this. And over the last 70 or 80 years, those discussions have all taken place and have varied over time. And we can also uh, discuss whether it's a good idea to try and regulate and orient or direct the flows or just let them happen. But I think it's pretty clear at this stage that no country in the world that is, has those levels of development can grow and thrive without a significant amount of foreign investment. It can be perhaps more credit than investment, although we did that back in the 1970s and early 80s. It didn't work out that well. But that discussion is there, but I think the broad framework is the same. Trade is similar with the exception of Brazil, maybe, not Mexico, um, none of our countries is big enough to really be able to function in autarky without trade. And trade has mostly been good for most Latin American countries. Not all of it, not all the time, et cetera. And that can, again, also be argued about. And I'm not referring to free trade or fair trade or directed trade. Just let's leave it at trade for the moment. Um, we can't live in autarky. Uh, I think it's kind of crazy. Our, our president of Mexico, the most recently, last few days or weeks, has gotten very upset, rightly so, about imported inflation because of Ukraine and a few other factors. Uh, and it's true, I mean, part of Mexi high Mexican inflation now is imported from the rest of the world, the Ukraine, what have you. Uh, COVID before then, etc. And so he's saying that the best solution to stop imported inflation is uh, self-reliance. Grow our own stuff. Produce our own stuff. Whether our stuff is gasoline or corn or wheat or fertilizer or whatever. We kind of tried that for 40, 50 years and it didn't work out very well. Uh, you know, if, it's sort of silly. I mean, you, you, you would hope that the democratically elected president of a big, important country like Mexico would not go around saying this nonsense. But he does. Say, you know, if we, el autoconsumo, I guess self-consumption? Yeah, well, autoconsumo. What, what do you mean autoconsumo? Plant your own corn in your backyard? Or like uh, pork that they had in Cuba? Chanchos, no, como le dicen? Pork in, Sp in Cuban. Pork, pigs. Puerco, cerdo, puerco. When uh, Fidel wanted every Cuban to have either a chicken or a pork in their backyard so that they could eat pork because there wasn't enough pork in the country, but if you had a pig in your bathtub, um, you could eat pork. And I'm not kidding, I I ask the expert over here. <laughs> you have to be very careful with these notions of ideological, economic, or any kind of self-sufficiency. Uh, it's a globalized world. You like it, you don't like it, that's what it is. And unless you're China, and even China, or unless you're the United States, or even the United States, it's very difficult to be self-sufficient. Look at what happened with the United States and COVID. Or look at what happened with COVID in Latin America. Not one of our countries was able to produce a vaccine within a year and a half to two years of the beginning of the pandemic. 
and the ones we produce, basically it's AstraZeneca in, um, in Argentina and then packaged in Mexico, the rest is nonsense. Uh, nobody in their right mind would take the Cuban vaccine except the Cubans because that's what they have, but nobody else. It hasn't been approved by any regulatory agency anywhere in the world. Okay, we don't produce COVID vaccines, that's life. So what do we do? We have to buy them or get them somewhere else. That means getting along with the rest of the world. It means having money to be able to purchase them. It means having good, faith, good, good vibes in order to be first in line instead of somebody else. It means all of these things. Does it count? Yes, it counts. Tens of thousands of people died unnecessarily in Brazil, in Mexico, in Peru, in a bunch of countries because we were unable to get the vaccines on time. Tens of thousands of lives were saved in a place like Chile because they went out and bought them, expensive, yes, but they had the money, they went out and bought them on time. I think that's the, way to, the best way to look at it. Hi, thank you so much for your talk. You mentioned um, Chile as being one of the le le less corrupt countries and more economically developed countries in Latin America. And as we know, there's a lot of wealth inequality in Chile as the revolts in Santiago and Valparaiso have demonstrated. I know they're drafting a new constitution. They have an assembly with a uh, looking to form a draft of a new constitution, and I was wondering what your thoughts on this new constitution were and how you see this affecting the rest of Latin America. Well, I was, I was very um, optimistic and excited even when after the protests in 2019, all of the Chilean political elite came together to decide that the best way to channel the protests into something useful and productive was through a constituent assembly, um, a constitutional assembly particularly given that the current constitution is still the 1980 Pinochet constitution with all of the amendments that were approved in 2005 under President Lagos. It's not that categorical, but I was very optimistic about that because it meant, you know, this is a place where you have street demonstrations, everybody's really upset, the, the millions of people demonstrated, uh, and then you try to do something productive with it. And, it looked great. Uh, I'm having some second thoughts about it now because the people who made up the assembly, were elected to draft the constitution, logically enough were the product of the demonstrations. And while they are you know, young and enthusiastic and uh, imaginative and innovative, they're also not only very radical but not necessarily very realistic. And what's coming out of the process so far is something that I'm kind of concerned about. I'm not concerned on principle. I'm concerned about the possibilities of the Constitution being rejected by a plebiscite, which will take place on September 4th. If too many oppositions are united around opposing the Constitution on single issue grounds, in other words, if one group of people opposes it because of, let's say, its very enlightened stance on abortion, they don't care about the rest, but they don't want that, and another group of people oppose it because of what they call judicial pluralism, they don't care about the rest, but they don't like that, or about eliminating the Senate or reducing its importance, Not, they don't care about the rest of it, but they don't like that. If you add up too many oppositions in a referendum, you can end up having it rejected. Not because everybody want, did not want all of it, but because a bunch of people didn't want part, each one, one part of that constitution. And that would be the worst of all worlds. And so the question then has to be, you know, is the best way to write a constitution as a result of a very significant, very important popular movement. Is that the best way? A lot of constitutions have been written that way. A lot haven't. It's a, it's a question, but we're, I'm less optimistic than I was uh, a few months ago. 
I'm kind of worried. I mean, the judicial pluralism thing, which I understand the logic of and the original peoples and their territory, et cetera, I understand it very well. We have a similar situation in Mexico. Um, but, you know, when you start getting into different laws and different rules applying to different sectors of society because of ethnic uh, or regional aspects, but not federalism, regional because of ties by ethnic groups, it can get very complicated, very, very complicated. And um, it's, it's thin ice there. And thank you very, very much, Dr. Castaneda. Unfortunately, regrettably, that brings our convocation to a close. Thank you once again for being here. Thank you all for being here. Thank you very Have much. Thank you all very, very much. Thanks for coming. Thank you. Thank you very much.